This is Thames from London. The government says we've stopped the terrorists gloating. British gas gets a rocket for abusing its monopoly. The author of a banned spy book names names. The ladies of Chernobyl who insist on going home. And the seals saved from the killer virus are free again. Good evening. The government has imposed an immediate ban on all broadcast statements by and interviews with those it regards as spokesmen for Ulster's terrorists. The opposition called the measures repressive and ridiculous. The Home Secretary, Mr. Hurd, ordered broadcasters not to transmit words spoken by members or supporters of outlawed organisations such as the IRA, as well as its legal political wing, Sinn Féin, and the loyalist organisation, the UDA. The ban does not apply to proceedings in Parliament or to candidates in local European or general elections. It's the past year of IRA bombing and killing, beginning with last November's attack at Inniskillen, that persuaded the government this summer to look at the whole of its policy for dealing with terrorism and its supporters in Northern Ireland. Ministers and many MPs have been incensed by the way people like Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams have appeared on television and radio after such attacks, sometimes to justify them, sometimes, as happened after Inniskillen, to make their apologies. In the past, Mrs Thatcher thought that moral pressure on the broadcasters would be enough to stop such appearances. In our societies, we don't believe in constraining the media, still less in censorship. But ought we not to ask the media to agree among themselves a voluntary code of conduct? Thank you very much. Now the Prime Minister, who was visiting the recuperating Greek Prime Minister today, thinks that as Ulster terrorism has continued and increased, so have the obligations on broadcasters. Hence Mr Hurd's announcement and the reactions to it in the Commons today. This is not a restriction on reporting, it is a restriction on direct appearances by those who use or support violence. Today's statement is intended to create the illusion rather than the reality of activity. They will make the government look simultaneously repressive and ridiculous. He now is refusing to allow them to appear on television and on radio. Would it therefore be consistent to permit them to sit in our council chambers and expect unionist politicians to sit with them. The government, though, is not considering an outright ban on Sinn Féin. Opposition MPs are questioning the new measures. I can't imagine anyone who might say, I wasn't in favour of bombing, but because Gerry Adams came on the air and gloated about innocent women and children being maimed and murdered, I'm going to rally to the IRA cause. I'm sure that his broadcasts do the IRA far more harm than good. I think they should be put out there, they should be put in front of the cameras every time they commit an atrocity. I think they should be asked to explain it to their own followers and to everybody else who is listening and watching and I think they should be made to answer in the type of public, public embarrassment that I know that can be caused to them. In my view it will provide an impetus and a help to the IRA and a potential damage to the network of our civil liberties. But Mr. Hurd dismissed all such objections, saying that the present situation could not continue. When you've had a, a bomb outrage and uh, there are pictures of, of, of bodies in distress and, and weeping relatives, and the next thing that happens on the screen, in people's living room, therefore, is somebody saying, well, you know, I support the armed struggle, or they deserved it. Um, whether it's uh, loyalist or whether it's IRA, that I think is not only offensive, but it's, it's wrong and it's perfectly reasonable to remove that. The measures were supported by the Northern Ireland Secretary. Well, they will help to deny part of that uh, propaganda weapon which uh, the terrorists have shamelessly exploited in this obscene way in which they seek to use the democratic system and pretend they're working through the power of argument, when actually their argument comes in the shape of bullets and bombs. Mr King, who began reviewing policy with the Prime Minister and other ministers two months ago, confirmed tonight that further measures will come soon. They could include a requirement on local election candidates in Ulster to make a public renunciation of violence to deal with the problem of the new ban being lifted during elections. 
Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. Today's Commons announcement and all of its ramifications had immediate effect on broadcasters. The restrictions mean that ministers no longer need to intervene over programming which the government considers gives a platform for terrorists. The television and radio ban has been instituted by powers the Home Secretary has under the Broadcast Act in which he can require the independent broadcasting authority to refrain from broadcasting any matter. And the BBC licence agreement, which allows him to ask the corporation to refrain from broadcasting at any specified time or at all times. This legal method was challenged by a leading law lord today. We must bear in mind that the courts apply the common law and the statute law. Uh, and at the moment, short of a statute, I cannot see how this can effectively be done unless, of course, the media uh, are sufficiently timid uh, to accept an executive direction. The Irish Republic's broadcasting organisation, RTE, has been working under a similar ban for over ten years. If they are on the, the list of prohibited organisations, we're not allowed to talk to them on anything, be it uh, running for election or, or growing roses or witnessing a road accident. Unlike the Republic, coverage of election campaigns by listed organisations will be permitted. But as soon as the election is complete, spoken words from candidates cannot be broadcast. This means, for example, that the last general election speech of Gerry Adams could not have been used. Apart from the difficulties in election coverage, it will mean broadcasters will have to find ways of reporting words without using actual sound. Another clause bans speeches by anybody in support of listed organisations, whoever they might be. Today, broadcasting organisations deny that they have been providing a platform for terrorist views. We have, from time to time, interviewed Sinn Féin spokesmen after, in reaction to some major event, they've been conducted responsibly because we all understand that what these extremist organizations stand for is abhorrent to many people. Nevertheless, uh, the British public opinion has never been more resolute than it is now, in my opinion, in defeating terrorism. And that owes a lot to the full and frank reporting that we've been able to conduct over of Northern Ireland over 19 years. The BBC said the ban sets a damaging precedent and will make our reporting incomplete. The former Irish minister who introduced the ban in the Republic has defended the measures. No, I don't think one is sacrificing the principle of free speech any more than when in wartime uh, people defend democracy uh, by restricting uh, freedom of speech in certain ways for the duration. Uh, this, in the case of a sustained terrorist offensive, which is what we have here, uh, merits at least considering steps of this kind uh, the British government certainly considered it for a very long time before taking the step, and I'm very glad they have taken that step now. Tonight, broadcasters from both ITN and BBC are preparing their bulletins, complying fully with the new restrictions. Sinn Féin is threatening to stage a demonstration at Westminster against the ban. But the party's president, Mr Gerry Adams, says he still won't take his seat in Parliament. He's Sinn Féin's only MP. The party commands more than a third of the Catholic vote in the province. In Belfast, Sinn Féin president Gerry Adams called a hurried press conference to give him what he said was his last opportunity to speak on television and radio. But the words uttered by the MP for West Belfast this morning, and which were broadcast nationally at lunchtime, can no longer be heard as a result of the Home Secretary's speech. What Jerry Adams told the press conference was that the ban came as no surprise, but Sinn Féin would not take it lying down. Sinn Féin has 61 councillors in the north and an 11% share of the vote. Jerry Adams claimed that now he, as the only MP, and those councillors have been gagged from fully publicising any mundane issues such as housing and welfare. It's matters like those which attract the vast majority of Sinn Féin support. The party, the fourth largest in the province, is renowned for its work amongst the Republican community. It has, however, never disguised its support for the IRA. Indeed, some Sinn Féin councillors have been jailed for terrorist-related offences. Jerry Adams himself was rumoured to have been a brigade commander for the provisionals in Belfast and was interned in the early 70s. Political experts who've studied the implication of today's ban for the IRA and for Sinn Féin say it will not damage the party at all. I don't think it's going to affect Sinn Féin in any way at all. In fact, they could gain from it. If it had been brought in in 1976 when the Dublin authorities brought in their ban, perhaps it would have worked across the border. But on this occasion, Sinn Féin will make a great degree of propaganda out of it, both here and in North America. And secondly, we have to remember that Sinn Féin are speaking to their own 
community inside a very, very tightly knit community. They don't need the mass media to do that. And the IRA will still be able to get its message across in publications such as their own newspaper and telexes from the Republican Press Centre which handles statements from the provisionals. Terry Lloyd, News at 10, Belfast. The government's threatening to end the monopoly of British gas after accusations it has been overcharging some business customers. The Trade Secretary, Lord Young, says he'll now make the industry more competitive. The Monopolies and Mergers Commission found that companies that couldn't use other forms of energy were charged higher prices than other customers. British Gas has been accused of practically holding its 21,000 industrial customers to ransom over their gas supply and charging varying and high prices. In some cases, these have been 80% higher than charges in other EEC countries. It's meant higher costs, lost jobs and no expansion, with some companies being almost strangled. On some of our products, uh, gas accounts for 24% of our cost. It's double the labour cost. And um, it is, it's in a, in a product range which is extremely marginal and extremely competitive. And it's meant that we've been facing prices from overseas which we could not compete with. Labour is blaming the government's handling of the British gas privatisation two years ago. It actually made the regulatory powers too weak to maximise the selling price for the Treasury, to maximise the profit for the city, and to maximum price to be paid by the consumer. That's what price of privatisation means. You remember that big advert? Well, tell Sid he's been had. Now the Department of Trade and Industry is to break the monopoly and follow the report's recommendations by offering 10% of any new gas field to other companies, making British Gas publish prices and stick to them, and restrict British Gas from refusing to supply an industrial company. Uh, they would naturally want to charge the highest price, but my job is to make sure that they charge a competitive price. And that's what the Monopolist Commission have recommended, and that's what we'll see them do. British Gas say they haven't had the report long enough to comment. However, their views are contained in one section of the report, where they say their prices shouldn't be compared with fuel prices on the continent, but with alternative fuel prices here in the UK. They say when the report's been thoroughly examined, they'll be ready to enter discussions, and trust that an agreement can be reached to allay all concerns. Maxine Mawinney, News at 10, Central London. The author of a controversial new book on spying tonight named a former senior MI5 man as a top Russian agent. The book by a British author, John Costello, has been held up by its publishers because the government wants three sensitive names deleted. Tonight at Cambridge University, Mr Costello named the three men. He also accused the former head of MI5 counterintelligence, Guy Liddell, of being the Soviet agent who recruited Russian spies, including Anthony Blunt, into the British security services. Tonight, less than a week after the Law Lord's ruling on Peter Wright's spy catcher, the Students' Union at Cambridge University, birthplace of the Blunt, Philby, Burgess and McLean spy ring, debated the motion this house would keep an official secret. Among those speaking against, historian John Costello. The publishers of his book, The Mask of Treachery, already out in America, have been asked by the government's D-Notice Committee to delete information gleaned from secret British intelligence documents available in archives in Washington. A sense this may well have been the book that Peter Wright would have written had he had access to documents. The documents include FBI warnings that Anthony Blunt was a spy, warnings which apparently went unheeded. The book names a codebreaker who'd worked at the government listening post GCHQ in Cheltenham and two school friends of spy Anthony Blunt who also went on to serve in MI5. It says they were blameless and were not traitors, but alleges that Blunt himself was controlled by a greater spy master who the author calls MI5's greatest mole. This mole was Guy Liddell. Guy Liddell came in from Special Branch and he rose to be Deputy Director of uh, 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 MI5. He was Head of Counterintelligence for many years. He was the person responsible for getting Blunt into MI5 and a number of the other people. And as the FBI records that have been declassified, the Blunt file in the United States show, he was the one who helped Blunt cover up the departure of Burgess and McLean. During this evening's debate, John Costello challenged his audience to join him in breaking the Official Secrets Act by reading copies of some of the documents used for his book, which were distributed from the gallery. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to publish and be damned, and I shall make traitors of you all. <laughs> the book itself is unlikely to be published here, so long as its author refuses to change it. Glenno Glaser, News at 10, Cambridge. 
In India, 164 people are now known to have died in two separate crashes. 130 were killed when a Boeing 737 came down in thick fog near Ahmedabad, and all 34 passengers and crew were killed when a Fokker friendship crashed in torrential rain in northeast Assam. Incredibly, five survivors were pulled from the wreckage of the Boeing, which crashed just before 7 o'clock local time this morning. Tangled metal was scattered over a two-mile radius. The only part of the plane still intact, the tail fin. Amongst the smoking metal, a few personal belongings. 130 people died in this crash. The plane was on a short flight from Bombay to Ahmedabad. Local officials say it was attempting to land in heavy fog. On its second approach to the runway, the jet fell from the sky, hitting a high voltage power line before exploding into a ball of flame. This was India's single worst domestic crash, and it also turned out to be the worst day in the country's aviation history. Two hours after this, a Fokker Friendship, a small turboprop aircraft, crashed in northeast India. All 31 passengers and three crew were killed. Time is running out tonight for the three whales trapped in pack ice off Alaska. The icebreaker, which is trying to get through to cut them free, is still stuck in ice itself 48 hours away. And latest reports say the whales are tiring rapidly. The whales' chances of survival seem to be getting better when rescue workers manage to cut two new breathing holes in the thick ice. But for some reason that marine biologists don't understand, the trapped whales are just swimming back and forth between the two original ice holes. Local people have given the whales Eskimo names. Siku meaning ice, Hotu meaning ice hole. The baby is called Konik or snowflake. They're surfacing for air twice as often as they were, suggesting they're now tiring and must breathe harder to stay alive. Time may be running out. The ice-breaking barge that had seemed their best hope is still stuck in the pack ice 200 miles away. Even if it does manage to get moving, it could take two days to reach the whales. An alternative rescue plan is now being seriously considered. A helicopter may drop concrete blocks onto the ice in the hope of smashing a channel through to the open sea. Siku, Hotu and Koenig have injured themselves by banging against the jagged ice. The biologists say they're approaching the point of total exhaustion and any rescue must come soon. Michael Jeremy, News at 10 in the United States. The Russian authorities have told the former inhabitants of Chernobyl, driven from their homes by the nuclear accident, that it's not safe to go home. The tower blocks are still empty, but some residents are defying the orders, a report in part two. Also, the first RAF crew finishes training on AWACS, and Mike Tyson's wife, Robin, says she doesn't want any money from the divorce. That's in a couple of minutes.